Welcome to the Connors Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. Right now with me is Marty Appel, who's written a great book about one of the great personalities in baseball history, Casey Stengel. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Casey Stengel, again, one of the great personalities in baseball history. Why did you decide to write a book about him? I mean, he's dead for years now. Well, there was a bestseller on Cleopatra recently, so <laughs> <laughs> that, wasn't a ba- that wasn't a boundary. But actually, Major League Baseball Network, when they came on the air in 2009, used to do these lists of superlatives like the best baseball movie ever and things like that. And they named Casey Stengel as the greatest character in the history of baseball, more than Babe Ruth, Yogi Berra, Dizzy Dean. So my editor at Doubleday conferred with me and said, maybe it's time for a Casey Stengel biography. It's been like 35 years since there was a big book about him. Uh, So we went ahead with it. And I did discover that not too many people under 40 have even heard of Casey Stengel. (laughs) So that was a challenge, really, to bring them back into the discussion. Um, Hopefully we did that. To get to those people under 40, now Casey Stengel was the only man who wore the baseball uniform of the Brooklyn Dodgers, the New York Giants, the New York Yankees, and the New York Mets. Yes, the only man so far, I like to say. Well, I don't think anybody, I don't think any Brooklyn Dodgers are going to put on Met uniforms or Yankee. No, I'm I'm still hopeful that they'll see the error of their ways and come back to New York, the Dodgers and the Giants. (laughs) Um, You go into Casey Stengel's early career, and he was a good baseball player, and some people don't realize that. Yeah, he was pretty good. He played 14 years. He was uh, on four World Series teams. He hit 284. He wasn't going to go to the Hall of Fame as a player, but he probably would have made a couple of all-star teams if they had all-star games back then. And even back, you know, in, in 1912, 1916, he was a character even back then. He was. He was, um, his, his nickname, Casey, which came from his hometown of Kansas City, kind of endeared him to the fans when everybody knew Casey at the bat. That was part of uh, American culture back then. And he would do things on the field that would be very fan-friendly. Even once when he came back to Brooklyn with his new Pittsburgh Pirates team, the fans were booing him at Ebbets Field, and so he put a sparrow under his cap. And when he came to bat and the fans booed, he doffed his cap and the sparrow flew out. And it was a way of him giving the fans the bird, and they loved it. (laughs) Forever after, they cheered Casey in Brooklyn. He had the opportunity to play for two great managers, Wilbert Robertson and, and Wilbur Robinson and uh, later John McGraw. McGraw was especially influential on him. McGraw really was a genius at, at his profession. And Casey used to sit next to John McGraw in the Giants dugout and learn so much from him. Sometimes there'd be a play on the field and Casey would just say out loud, oh, great play. And McGraw would say, no, it wasn't, and I'll tell you why. And Casey would learn so much from that. And McGraw was kind of grooming Casey to be a manager someday. Even in spring training, one year he split up the Giants into two separate divisions and had Casey uh, run the spring training camp at that second division. Casey didn't like that because he thought it was cutting into his chance to be a regular player on the Giants, but it was good experience for him. Now, Casey Stengel had a pretty good World Series one year. Um, He was a good World Series player performer and in 1923 the first year of yankee stadium he hit against the yankees the first world series home run ever in yankee stadium now as was usually the case with casey there was a story with it it was an inside the park home run and he had an insert in his shoe a little rubber uh, insert to protect against an injury which flew out while he was running the bases Now, he was already thought of as an old man, so he's running the bases and he's yelling, Go, Casey! Go, Casey! to himself, out loud. He slides home, and he says to the on-deck hitter, I think I lost my shoe. And Hank Gowdy, the on-deck hitter, looks at him and says, Well, how many were you wearing, Casey? (laughs) Because he still had had two on, but that little rubber insert had flown out. (laughs) Now, he had another home run in that World Series. was a little bit controversial. He did, and what made it it was an important, like, game-winning home run, and what made it controversial was as he was running the bases, he was, like, thumbing his nose 
at the Yankees uh, derisively. And it so upset the Yankees that they went to the commissioner and demanded that Casey be uh, suspended. And the commissioner just said, no, that's just Casey Stengel. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, but um, he really made his mark in that World Series. Now, then Stengel was traded to Boston, and that was the end of his playing career, and he became a manager. Can you explain how did he become a manager? What started his managerial career? The owner of the Boston team, Judge Emil Fuchs, uh, also owned the Worcester, Massachusetts minor league team, and he wanted Casey to be a player manager at Worcester. So that ended Casey's major league career, and he sent him to Worcester, and thus became began a long and not very uh, successful managing career, which eventually caught fire when he went to the Yankees many years later. But his managing days started in Worcester, Massachusetts. So he's, he's managing the minor leagues, and eventually he gets a, a chance to come back to Brooklyn. He was always popular in Brooklyn. Uh, the Dodgers didn't have much money. They weren't going to be able to give him a good ball club to work with. It would be the pattern that would repeat in Boston some years later. Uh, popular player, no money, bad team. And Casey did prove over the course of his career that if you don't have good players, no matter how smart a manager you are, chances are you're not going to do well. Um, <clears throat> so he managed unsuccessfully in Brooklyn, but it was a popular team. Dodger fans were very loyal. Ebbets Field usually got pretty good crowds. Casey lived in the neighborhood. He liked talking to the fans as he walked around the neighborhood. So uh, it was a good stop for him, and it got his feet wet as a major league manager. But eventually he gets fired from Brooklyn. He gets fired with one year to go on his contract, which was so he sat out 1937. Um, the only time he was out of the game from like 1910 until 1961. But in 37, at the height of the Depression, and Casey and his wife Edna had lost all their money, um, <laughs> he and some other ball players get a tip about investing in an oil well in Texas. And uh, the well comes in. It's still producing money for the Stengel estate to this day. And Casey, <clears throat> Casey became a rich man in that one year that he had off when they paid him not to manage. Again, some of the younger people, what number did Casey Stengel wear on his back after that? Um, well, he was famous for number 37 that he wore with both the Yankees and the Mets. And he had that number retired by both of those teams, which is pretty unusual. Back with Brooklyn, like, uh, he was number 31. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes talking to Marty Appel about his book on Casey Stengel. Welcome back to the Connors Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. We're talking right now to, to Marty Appel about his book on Casey Stengel. So we're right now, Casey, 1937, he gets another managing opportunity. What happens then? In 1937, he, um, I'm sorry, 1937, he goes to Boston after sitting out 37. And there he's managing the low-budget Boston Bees, which were the Boston Braves, but that was the name they were going by in those days. And again, not a very good team, not much success there. Finishes 7th, 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 7th. Can't really get into the first division. Um, but in 1943, just before the start of the season, literally just before, uh, he's crossing the street in Kenmore Square in Boston, a very complicated intersection. It's late at night. Uh, there's a <clears throat> World War II blackout in effect, so the street lights are off. Even headlights were taped on the top to reduce the, uh, the lights. Casey gets hit by a taxi, badly injured, misses three months of the season, is left with a permanent limp, uh, it looked like he might not live for a while. It certainly looked like he might not walk on his own for a while. But by the summer, he came back, finished the season, and that was the end of his years you know, managing Boston. He goes to manage in the minor leagues, and eventually, obviously, he gets hired by the Yankees. 
Why did the Yankees hire Casey Stengel? He was a losing manager up to that point. He was not only a losing manager, he had a reputation of being clownish, which was anything but what the lordly Yankees were. The Yankees were all about efficiency and professionalism and you know, playing the game right. Um, but he had a wonderful relationship with the Yankees general manager, George Weiss, who saw in Casey a baseball mind that was like no other. Casey could see things that other people couldn't see, and Weiss thought Casey Stengel would be very good at this job. Now, most baseball fans, experts, were outraged that the Yankees were hiring this clown to manage the Yankees. But in that first year, 1949, despite more than 70 injuries the team incurred, Casey takes them all the way to the world championship. Well, that relaxed everybody. Now all of a sudden Casey Stengel was seen as a fine manager, and all he wanted to do was prove that he could win if he had good players. Well, bang, 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 he wins four more to give him five world championships in a row, and his ticket to Cooperstown is punched. Now he's a baseball immortal and one of the great managers of all time. Let me ask you this question, because there's some different opinions about Casey Stengel. Some people think, yes, he was a great manager, he was a brilliant manager with the Yankees. Other people say, well, anybody could have managed the Yankees at that time to world championships. I do hear that a lot, and probably there are other managers, given that array of talent that was on the Yankees, that would have been successful. But you know what? When you win five in a row and you win 10 pennants in 12 years and seven world championships, it has something to do with the manager. There's no denying it. Now, he wasn't a player's manager. The players didn't love him. The ones who had played for Joe McCarthy and then Stengel, like Joe DiMaggio and Tommy Henrik and Phil Rizzuto, preferred McCarthy. The ones on the other end who played for Stengel and then Ralph Houck preferred Ralph Houck. But nobody seemed to have a problem cashing their World Series check every October. Bringing it up, how did Joe DiMaggio and Casey Stengel get along? Uh, everybody was watching that to see how they would get along. DiMaggio was already <clears throat> the elite player in the game. And Casey was uh, going to establish that he was the boss of the team. That was his assignment. Uh, he t put it to the test the first day of spring training in 1949 when he read the new spring training rules for the Yankees. And that included that the players were forbidden to go to the dog track in St. Petersburg at night. Well... That's what Joe DiMaggio did every night. Everybody who knew Joe knew that. So, my gosh, here's a line in the sand. What's going to happen now? And what happened was that DiMaggio went to the track anyway, and when Casey was asked about it, he said, well, I have no firsthand knowledge of that. I wasn't there, so I have no comment. And the crisis passed, and they just sort of agreed to get along as best they could. And it produced three straight world championships those years together. But could you imagine today 2,500 cell phone photos of Joe at the track and the newspaper headlines all saying, what now, Casey? <laughs> that is a very good point. Now, 1954, obviously Cleveland won the, the pennant that year. The Yankees really didn't have a bad year. Actually, they won the most games they ever won under Casey, 103 wins. But it was just Cleveland's year. Cleveland had a terrific team, a fabulous pitching staff. So the Yankees had to settle for second place, but without any embarrassment or disgrace at all. All right, so 54 comes by. Of course, they're back in the World Series in 55, 56, 57, 58. Casey Stengel's there, and in 59, they don't, they don't win the, the series. Uh, they don't win the pennant, I'm sorry. And in 1960, they lose to Pittsburgh in the World Series. Yes. One of the best World Series ever played. The Yankees really outplayed Pittsburgh in the series, but Bill Mazeroski hit a home run in the bottom of the ninth inning of the seventh game, and the Pirates win, and Casey gets fired a couple of days later. It was really a shock to the sports world. Okay, so he takes the team to the seventh game of the World Series. He's won 10 pennants in 12 years, and he's fired? 
Yes, and as he said, I'll never make the mistake of being 70 years old again. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Yankees uh, use that as the reason. Um, they, they said that they're instituting a new retirement age policy, and Casey had reached retirement age, and they were going to make a change and make Ralph Houck the manager. Uh, Casey was bitter about it. He uh, didn't go back to Yankee Stadium for 10 years for an old-timers day. Um, and when he went to the Mets two years later, who were just starting as an expansion team, part of it was an opportunity to stick it to the Yankees and get even and win fans and win the hearts of New Yorkers managing the Mets. Why did Casey Stengel take the job with the Mets? I mean, there were other job opportunities for him. He did have an opportunity to manage the Los Angeles Angels, who were just starting out, and the San Francisco Giants, which in their new home, but uh, that had been the team he had played for, the New York Giants. Um, but he passed on those. He was really settling into retirement. But then his friend George Weiss, who was now the president of the Mets, called him and said, we need you, Casey. We need to establish ourselves in New York. You can, you're the man to do this. So at age 72, Casey came out of retirement, went back to New York, and really, really put the Mets on the map. He didn't manage the way he did in New York. He really turned over a lot of that game day situation stuff to the coaches. But uh, his job, and he recognized it, was public relations, and he did win over the hearts of the writers and through them the hearts of the fans of New York. How would you summarize it? What was Casey's legacy with the Mets? It was in establishing the credibility of the team. The team was bad. Casey was used to that from his early days as a manager. But he knew how to charm the writers. He always used to say it's important to learn the writers' names more than the players. <laughs> and um, he just... Um, whether it was appearing on commercials or promos or doing funny interviews, he was on What's My Line and I've Got a Secret and all those big TV shows of the time. And he worked at uh, making the Mets popular to the point where Johnny Carson was starting to do Mets jokes in his opening monologues. And that was what they wanted Casey Stengel for. They wanted the Mets to have be bona fide competition to the Yankees in New York and even today, Casey used to always say the Mets were amazing. And today's newspaper headlines will often say, Amazons defeat Cubs 6-5 to five, or something like that. They still use the word amazing for the Mets. In your research on, on Casey Stengel's life, what is the one thing that impressed you about him that maybe the average fan doesn't, doesn't know about Casey Stengel? Well, he was a very smart guy. Um, made a lot of money in oil. Uh, his wife's family owned a bank in Glendale, California, and he was a vice president of the bank. Um, he was all baseball, 365. Uh, he had no hobbies, no other interests than baseball. But he also saw the baseball community as much more than the players and the writers. He really embraced the fans as part of that work-a-day work -a community. He used to go back to his hotel on Central Park South when he managed both the Yankees and the Mets. And instead of going upstairs, he'd unwind by walking all around the, the full block down to 6th Avenue and back up 58th Street uh, and stop and talk to the fans all along the way. He was always recognized, which he loved, and he'd recount the game and replay the game with the fans in the streets. He would even do that at airports at the baggage claim. He loved being recognized, and he loved just talking baseball with the fans. He thought they were really as much a part of the game as the players were. Now, one thing about your book, it's worth the price of the book, is just to read Casey Stengel's testimony before Congress. <laughs> well, we didn't mention Stengelese, which is the language that he spoke all onto himself. It was essentially double talk without any punctuation in it, just long run-on sentences, and he would use it to avoid an answer or to stall for time until he thought of an answer. And he used it in Congress when in 1958 he testified before a Senate committee 
looking into baseball's antitrust exemption. They asked him one question, and he proceeded to tell his life story over the next 20 minutes without a pause for a period or a comma. (laughs) So he had all the senators laughing, and when Mickey Mantle followed him, Mickey just said, well, I agree with everything Casey just said. (laughs) All right, so the name of the book, Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character by Marty Appel. Thank you very much for telling your story on the show. Okay, you know, I I enjoyed that interview. You know, Casey Stengel, you know, even in my own family, it was a little bit of a debate. You know, some some family members said, hey, Casey Stengel, anybody could have managed those. 